everyone for joining us. We are so excited to start off our HIE Awareness Month um, with a live Q&A from Dr. Pia Wintermark. And we're, thank you so much for joining us. And we can't wait to um, disseminate all of this wonderful information to our community. So thank you. I, I would love to introduce you and then um, give a little bit of your background and then you can add on anything I missed if that's okay with you. Okay, Th thank you, Diana. Thank you for the invitation. So happy to be there too. Um, so a, a bit about me, I, I'm originally from Switzerland, uh, where I did my medical school and residency and fellowship in neonatology. And, and then I moved to the US in Boston for three years to do another fellowship uh, because I wanted to do more research and clinic. And then finally, I joined uh, Montreal in, in Canada to open my lab, where it was a good mix between uh, North America and Europe, you know, a good compromise between the two of them. Of course. And um, so you are a pediatrician, you are a neonatologist. Right now, you work at Montreal Children's Hospital, correct? Yes, correct. Um, but you're also associated with the... Um, Newborn Brain Society, and um, your professor, associate professor at McGill University. And I also read that back in 2010, you started something called the Neo Brain Lab, um, which was devoted to understanding the causes and consequences of um, brain and eye damage in, in babies. So you're, you've done a lot. <laughs> yeah, quite, quite a few things in, in a few years. Yeah, yes, and I'm um, very happy, you know. To what be drew you? to be so interested um, uh, to the field of neon neonatal neurology? Um, I, I think it started when, when I was a medical student. Um, I took care of a very uh, little sick uh, baby girl um, and she developed severe brain injury because she got very sick. And I still remember to this day um, when the doctor, uh, at that time I was a medical student just uh, following the doctors, um, and they discussed with the parents. And I remember the mom asked, you know, but what can we do for the brain, you know, now that they have the injury? And like the answer was, you know, like we can help the heart, we can help the lungs, but the brain, there is not much we can do. And, and she was frustrated. And I remember I, I find that frustrating too. And I, and I think it started like that uh, all day. I started the research after that on baby with HIE. Um, to get imaging on this baby to understand how brain perfusion was uh, influencing uh, the injury to the brain. Uh, at that time in Switzerland, there was no cooling. Um, I then moved to Boston where uh, when I went there, they had started cooling as standard of care. Um, and then I continued the imaging study. And finally, I moved in Montreal where um, I started also to test some uh, treatment, uh, preclinical, to see if we could maybe repair the brain. Um, yeah. We continued the imaging study, and, and then now more recently, in the recent year, we, we have started testing this treatment to see if it could work to repair the brain. Um, so That's it's uh, uh, many years, you know, uh, yeah. you know, that comes, you know, from one question uh, that came along the way, you know. Well, we're so grateful for your journey um, and, and for you, again, to take the time today to just go over just a, a massive HIE overview and, and research update, because it is, it's a, it's a big topic and there are so many rabbit holes that um, we could jump down. So it's, it's wonderful to have, you know, uh, valid and, and um, just meaningful information come from someone like you. So thank you. Um, and with that, I think we're just going to get started with our first question, which is really more of, can you provide us with a timeline of developments regarding HIE? Um, like for instance, we'll start with one more specific question. Has the process of receiving an HIE diagnosis changed over time? And if it has, how so? Um, I think it changed over time, but I, I think, you know, what has been the biggest game changer for HIE is really uh, the therapeutic hypothermia. Um, now it's, it's standard of care since uh, more than 10 years. 
um, the first study was published in 2005. So, so now it's becoming old, but it's still new, you know, uh, recent. And it's uh, certainly the only treatment that has proven so far efficient um, to help this baby and prevent some of their damage to the brain. Um, and it's now, you know, uh, uh, has mentioned the standard of care in high income country. Uh, probably what therapeutic hypothermia trial and then becoming standard of care has permitted is um, to define more precisely what is what was HIE and, you know, to get the criteria and to get this diagnosis a, a bit more clear. Uh, mm -hmm. and to be able to compare from one center to the other, wherever in the world, you know, uh, you are. So, so I think that's one of the things because maybe we're arriving, you know, before and probably at this diagnosis, but there was nothing to offer. So it, it was not, I guess, a formal diagnosis, you know, they were probably coming later for seizure uh, mm. and things like that. Now they come sooner because they are identified um, as a HIE and then uh, possibly offer the treatment if they meet the criteria. Um, so I think that's what has mainly changed how is they find uh, HIE. Yeah, and then with that, you know, from a medical standpoint, do you believe that perceptions of diagnoses then have changed? You know, because now, um, like you said before, if, if you receive an HIE diagnosis, even if they knew what that was at the time, like, there was very little they could do to help. And now that there is a standard of care and there is a procedure to follow, do you feel like that has changed how people perceive this diagnosis when they receive it? Yeah, and I, I think it exactly changed because of the hypothermia, because now you have something that you can tell the parents, ah, I'm not sure it will work, but at least I have something that I can offer to try that has been shown to prevent in some case uh, the injury doesn't always work and and you know like I, I, I always say that to the parents uh, but but at least we have something that we can try on and I, I think that's very different and um, uh, exactly how you know the the whole the whole story started you know before you had nothing to offer so uh, if the baby come very sick you pretty know that he will stay very sick and with schooling, you know, some of these babies get much better. Um, and, you know, some have no secular, so um, it's nice. definitively a change. Um, now, so many parents have questions about um, just HIE classification and um, long-term outcomes associated with them. Um, so parents, can often be confused, understandably so, um, when it comes to referencing and understanding what is meant by a level of HIE, whether that's mild, moderate, or severe, um, when some will get a SARNET score, maybe an MRI interpretation, and um, even a clinical pres uh, presentation assessment. So if you could kindly break down the context of each of those classifications, like maybe what are like SARNET Scale, MRI results, clinical presentation, what are they used for? And what do parents really need to know about each of those? Yeah, I think it's a good question because it's true that the, these parents, they are, um, they are projected in a NICU, you know, which is an environment that they didn't think they will visit one day. And then there is all this term and all these things to suddenly understand uh, quickly. So it's very important. So um, well, the SANAT exam is, is the first exam that we do uh, when the baby is admitted. Um, it it uh, permit to uh, determine, you know, the severity of the HIE. Um, in some place, it's complemented by a bedside um, electroencephalogram, you know, to also see the severity of HIE. And it's basically one of the criteria um, that you use to determine I mean, if the baby meet the criteria for cooling or not, you know, if it is moderate, what's called moderate or severe, you meet the criteria. If you're mild, depending on the center, you, you may need the criteria and there is research ongoing, you know, to see if it's useful. Uh, hypothermia for the moderate has been shown to be really efficient, not always for the severe. So, so that's mm -hmm. the first assessment that, that you get. Um, then what, what is very important is to see the clinical presentation and especially the clinical evolution 
of the baby over the first few days of life um, because it's a, a very good indicator of, also of the prognosis. Um, and study has shown that baby recovering quickly, more quickly have better prognosis um, than the one that don't recover. So I, I think for the parents, it's very important to know that keeping an, keeping an eye um, on the changes um, that happen during the first few days of life is very important. And each progress is kind of a small victory because it means uh, the baby is recovering. Um, and finally, I think there is the MRI result mm -hmm. um, that gives, you know, will give the picture of the extent of the brain injury uh, related to the HIE. It's typically done after therapeutic hypothermia is finished. Um, and then the doctor tried to uh, review this imaging, put it in, in perspective with the clinical evolution, with the SANAT on admission, and try to give a prognosis um, to, to the parents. Uh, parents no. would ask to review the imaging uh, with the, the doctors and things like that. Yeah. Um, to go back to the clinical presentation and evolution, um, you, you mentioned that like a baby who recovers more quickly or makes more progress, you know, has potential for better outcomes. What, what does progress look like in those first few days from a medical standpoint? Like if I'm a parent I, and I want to see progress, what would I be looking for? So, so I, I think uh, what is important is uh, how the baby looks at the beginning. Um, and I will say if the baby start to notice that he's cold and start to cry um, and notice that he's not as comfortable on the cooling blanket uh, is probably a good sign. Mm -hmm. um, the one that more reaction to what is the surrounding, you know, like is, is probably a good sign because uh, uh, many of them at the beginning have no reaction. You put them on the cooling blanket um they don't move much and all that so starting to have more movement to open the eyes um starting to react exactly to the cold or to the noise that there is in the room um all these small things are you know would be encouraging okay wonderful thank you um and then in terms of determining um long-term outcomes for children with HIE for each of those classifications, like mild, moderate, severe. Um, what What's the range of long-term outcomes that we see with those classifications in mind? Um, and maybe what do those look like? Yeah, so, so the range of long-term outcome is very wide. Um, there is some children who have absolutely no, no secular, as mentioned, but there is also children who will not survive uh, the NICU period and children who will have uh, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, and other um, severe issue in their daily life. Um, so, so the prognosis, you know, uh, is the long-term, possible long-term outcome is very wide. And, and to this day, it remains very and, uh, and very challenging to accurately predict, you know, based in the NICU what will happen uh, uh, next, you know. We usually use what we mentioned, the clinical exam, the MRI and the EG to, to predict, but we are not always uh, accurate. And, and I think we, we discussed this uh, several times with Betsy uh, uh, and OPA HA because the MRI day, you know, when the parents receive this result is always a big day that the parents are expecting, but we cannot always um, uh, predict for sure. So like you will, you know, I think there is many progress to be done there to understand also for our parents what is useful to understand and to make sure they have understand a bit what we are saying, you know, that we speak the same language and that is mm. useful for them for the future. You know, I think that's very important. So um, the reality of the situation is, you know, if you receive a, a mild, moderate or severe classification that there's no manual, there's no guidebook that says if you're in this classification, then this is a long term outcome, or this is a challenge, or this is a, um, something you're going to overcome. It, it really just depends on it's a case by case basis, right? <laughs> and, and, and yes, it's exactly that. And, and it's also because the brain of a baby is plastic. 
Mm. Um, you know, the same happen, the same thing ta that happened to this baby would happen to us. Pretty much, we would know that, that there is not much else that we can do and uh, recover, right. um, because their yeah. brain is plastic. If if there is a brain part that are not injured, <coughs> they could potentially um, be stimulated in a way and maybe try to recover. So so this is why you know sometimes we say prognostic will be very uh, poor, but in the end, the kids still do um, lots of things that, you know, that we didn't expect. Uh, it's a good surprise for us, but I think, you know, these parents that have heard these things, you know, saying like, you know, it will not work, it will not work. Uh, for them, it removed them a lot of hope um, yeah. at the beginning, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if, if we could begin talking about some um, research updates in the field, uh, what types, let's start um, with a really positive light. Let's um, talk about research that you believe is the most promising or exciting that is currently happening or maybe is in the pipeline to happen. Uh, yeah, so so there is a, a good thing, you know, it's like there is lots of ongoing research, um, testing new treatment, trying to uh, improve prognosis marker, improving uh, monitoring at the bedside, improving management of seizure, and also better supporting parents through the journey. So hopefully yeah, there is a, a lot of innovation um, to come, you know, in the following years. Yeah. Um... And then we, we also have a lot of families that push for um, gross motor milestones and development. Um, but do you, you know of any research studies um, that can help improve or help determine at least longitudinal or long-term outcomes for non-motor challenges that some of these children may experience? So, so, so I think that provider and family often push for the this gross motor milestone because they, they are the one that have been the most studied and the most uh, often reported and the most often discussed. So then to compare this, this is the easy tool that have been used. Uh, but there is only a few research that have looked at long term outcome. You know, uh, up to ten years of age in this baby and more detailed cognitive outcome. Um, I'm aware there is a colleague of mine here in Montreal, uh, Marie brossard Racine. She just received a grant um, to look at nine-year outcome uh, of a baby with HIE treated with cooling. It will be um, the first study with a, a large sample size, uh, more than 100 babies uh, with mm. MRI at nine years and, you know, um, extensive uh, neurocognitive uh, development. So, so not only the basic milestone uh, matter, but you know some of the finest thing that at nine years uh, we may not have seen. So, so I think and 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 we we know that there is maybe other study in other part of the world, similar study that will start. So, I think that will bring uh, this information that for now we we don't have. You know, we have this gross milestone, but you know we need. Uh, to understand the, the finest uh, uh, cognitive uh, impairment and things like that to better um, have tool and support for the, these kids when, when they grow older, you know. Yeah. Um, did you mention that um, you, you, you do your own research too, right? Could you um, give us a, an overview of what that looks like and, and maybe the main goals of what you'd like to accomplish there? Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, my research is all based on the on the question I had, you know, when I was a medical student in is uh, can can the brain uh, of a baby that is injured uh, be repaired? And uh, so um, it all started uh, like that. We uh, I started with a preclinical model uh, where we try a drug is called sildenafil. The other name of sildenafil is Viagra. Um, that is very known for other things, but um, some side effect of the Viagra uh, and have been shown in adult stroke uh, that can, it could help for the brain. Um, so we tested it in a preclinical model of HIE. Um, we showed that it reduced, we, uh, it reduced the brain injury. Uh, it prevented the death of some brain cells. It regenerated some brain cells and it decreased the inflammation uh, on the brain. Um, 
So then we started to uh, run the phase one trial. What we, we do a bit differently is most of the trial and treatment ongoing and now for HIE, they try something at the same time as cooling mm -hmm. um, to try to prevent the damage. What, what we did is we say, let's, let's get the damage. So we don't, uh, we do an MRI on day two. Um, during the cooling, we make sure that they have a brain injury. That's one of the criteria. They have to have brain injury on day two. And we wait after this day two to start this additional treatment because our goal is really to repair. We don't want to prevent, we want to, to see if we can repair the brain once you have injury. So we have the day two MRI that give us the extent of injury. We give the treatment for seven days and then we see if we have improved uh, the injury by day 30. Um, mm -hmm. And then we follow the baby. So it's a bit different than the trial out there because we wanted to take the approach, can, can we repair? Um, now we have finished the two uh, phase one study. First, the feasibility, so it was feasible to give the drug in the baby. Uh, we did pharmacokinetic to try to find the maximum dose we can give without having side effect. Um, and then now we are setting up the phase two study, uh, hopefully in, in several centers in Canada. So um, we are crossing the finger, you know, like all these studies take lots of years um, yeah. and until we get the result. Um, it involved the participation of many family. Uh, we don't want to give false hope, but in some, you know, we think it may help. Um, so hopefully, in another few years, uh, we'll have the result uh, to see if it works or not. Now, in your experience um, with your own research and just from what you know about what's out there, um, what are some knowledge gaps um, in the research or barriers to um, the barriers that this research has to overcome? And, and how is there a way to fill those knowledge gaps or is there a way to overcome some of those barriers um, to get the, the research that we want and, and can make hopefully some wonderful impacts in our community? Um, so, so, so I think one of the, the question that remains also that is very important is how the treatment in the NICU could be optimized to improve outcome. Um, and, you know, many places have studied in their own centers, how can this be improved? And, and I think, uh, again, it's an idea we discussed with, with Betsy, um, another member of the Newborn Brain Society. Uh, it may be interesting to put the centers all together, you know, instead of a few small samples here and there, we try to understand, put all these samples together, uh, create a database of HIE, you know, um, who knows, around the world, you know, like if it was possible, uh, where like then you can run quality improvement initiative mm. uh, and improve the management of this baby. So ideally that, that would be uh, in interesting things because that has been done for premature babies. And this is uh, how the treatment, you know, in the first day of life of this baby has been a lot of improved. Um, now it will be time to, to do the same for HIE baby so that we can improve uh, the treatment. Yeah. And definitively another um, gap that is there is, um, we have hypothermia for high income countries. Um, it didn't show that it worked as well for middle and low income countries uh, where they have um, a lot of HIE and definitively uh, there should be more research to find solution that, that works there. Um, and it's also one of the thing why we tested sildenafil because um, sildenafil is cheap, um, is already used there because uh, in many baby with lung problem it's used, so not for the brain, but we know it's tolerated. Um, so like if it would work and repairing, you don't have as much the um, running that you need for cooling because cooling, you need to be there within the six hours, you need to get started. This one, because we started with a delay on purpose, we may have time to get this baby. So. Uh, Really, hopefully, we can find solutions that work for babies around the world, you know, with HIE. This reminds me a lot of um, a, a month or two back, we had another Q&A with another doctor, Dr. Atul Maholtra, who does a lot with stem cells. And he said one of the barriers um, of research and just progress is not only the fact that, you know, sometimes 
you can't get an HID, HIE diagnosis fast enough, like you just said, you know, so like to start cooling. And another thing he said is that, you know, in order for a trial to be really effective, you need a large pool of children. And it's like, where, where can you get at one time, you know, a hundred children with HIE born, you know, so that's something that he mentioned too. So it just reminds me a lot of that. So um, just like you said, just trying to find a way to be creative and, um, and, and solve some of those issues. Yeah. yeah. Put, put yeah. the number together. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, are there any other HIE relevant research updates in the field that um, we haven't discussed yet that you feel like we should mention to our community before we move on to the next topic? Um, no, I, th I think, you know, we discuss uh, mo most of it uh, so far. We can discuss about research, you know, for many yeah. hours. So like oh, if I know. you have a specific question, you know, we can answer, but uh, Perfect. I think yeah, the main gap are there. Um, so I think a lot of parents, you know, after they get discharged from the NICU, um, I mean, it, it's, we can't deny that medical providers um, give families the best start that they possibly can after an HAE diagnosis. But we also can't undermine the importance for families to have access at home to tools and resources that they need to create a supportive environment as well. Um, so with that in mind, what in your professional opinion, what would you consider the ideal follow-up care cadence after a NICU discharge with an HIE diagnosis? So, so I, I think, you know, uh, all these parents should have a regular pediatrician or family doctor, um, like any other kids. And then there should be a follow-up for neurodevelopment and maybe with occupational therapy, you know, to help the parents give indication how they can help and all that. Um, I think there is key age that are um, done in, in most places is 18 months and 36 months, um, because it, it corresponds to um, a milestone that you should have, and then we can provide more services. I think ideally, um, all these babies should be uh, followed longer, at least up to school age, um, to provide, you know, the best, better support that we can, and, and ideally even longer, uh, you know, to make sure to capture and provide help as needed uh, along the way. Because I think, you know, the problem is when a, an issue is noticed, then it takes time to get the services um, to help. And then maybe you lose some time here because you cannot get the services. So a better access to services, you know, would be also ideal, you know. Um, and that's a, kind of a good segue into my next question, which is, um, you know, there's, there's so many early interventions available, um, depending on what uh, the child needs, OT, PT, speech and language, um, everything. Do you have any advice as to how parents can avoid something that our community calls intervention burnout, <laughs> um, where maybe they, they want to help in as many ways as they can, um, and so they are doing all of these early interventions um, to try to maximize growth and progress. Um, but then it just, I mean, that's taxing. That's very taxing for a, a family. Um, so do you have advice in terms of like how to balance providing and giving your child those services, but also um, just being present <laughs> with your child at home and doing what you can for your own kid yourself? Um, I, I think it's a very good question, uh, uh, and, and parents often ask also in the NICU exactly, you know, what they, they can do. So, so it's very true because, as we said, the uh, baby brain is plastic, um, that adequate st stimulation could potentially help the brain. Um, but what is important is also not to overstimulate because a uh, baby brain uh, needs to rest uh to be able to grow you know uh so so it's important so um some activity one or twice a day you know in the first months of life uh is very good and usually there is this occupational therapist that can show some exercise some gymnastic you know uh that can be done and then some sometimes we forget that the easy step of reading or even speaking to your baby is already some kind of stimulation of the brain 
um, that has shown positive influence, you know, like so. So I think, yes, there is this thing because we start reading Googles and we want to do more and all that. It can be um, become quick overwhelming. I, I think becoming a parent is already exhausting. Um, so I, I obviously when faced in addition with HIE, um, it's additional stress and overwhelming factor. Um, I would say that the basic rule is also that the parents have to survive first uh, to take care of the kid. And that's what we forget often when we have a, a child that is sick. Um, so it's important to remember that it's uh, not a sprint, but a marathon. So it's mm -hmm. important to take care of self, um, to have hope, to celebrate the, the victory, small or big. Um, and it's very important to get support for um, not only the child, but also the parents, uh, if needed. You know, there's this old saying, uh, you need a village to raise a kid. I, I think it's even more true if you have a baby um, uh, with HI. And, and I think uh, what is also very important and, and that I've met uh, very often uh, with the parents is that they, they feel guilty in some way. Um, I have very uh, often, you know, the parents, but especially the mom that got the impression that they did something wrong. And this is why the baby has HIE. And, and I always try to discuss when I'm in the NICU that um, it's not at all their fault because typically parents of a baby with HIE are parents that have like pay extra attention all along the way, the pregnancy, make sure that everything uh, went perfectly and something unexpected uh, happened at the time and, and nothing could have changed that, nothing that the mom uh, could have done. And I think for the mom, it's very important to hear this message, very important for the par the dad too, because so that yeah. he, he doesn't say uh, anything, but it's a, it's a feeling, you know, uh, to be removed from the mom. And I think that's very important. Yeah, we we actually have a Q&A coming up next week with our social worker to talk about how to manage guilt because that is one of the prominent um, questions that comes up and concerns on our Facebook pages and, and our feedback. So that's huge. Yeah. And, um, and I, I think it, it, you know, it takes probably a lot of convincing um, to tell a parent or a mom to say, you know, you, you can put yourself first sometimes because even with a child who may not be sick or isn't experiencing some of these issues, that's like you said, that's still hard, <laughs> you know? I'm so sure. yeah, um, I, I heard a, an amazing analogy um, back in the day where about just like taking care of your own mental health too. And like when you're on an airplane and if the oxygen masks come down, you have to put your own oxygen mask on first before you put it on your kid. Um, and so I always, you know, that's just something that reminded me of that too. I know, um, I know, but it's never the reflex of a mom. I think the mom will right. always oh, yeah. take care of her yeah. kids, you know, and then like you, you have to remember that, yeah, exactly, yeah. You, you have to I survive know. first, you know, yeah. I know, when it comes down to it, I'll probably put the oxygen mask on the kid, you know, <laughs> when it really, you know, but, um, but at least I can repeat the mantra in my head. Um, yeah. Now, um, before we leave, I believe we covered most of everything in our comments, but um, we always love to ask our professionals any um, to suggest any tools or resources for our community members. Um, in this case, do you have anything to recommend to better understand HIE um, research or development as a whole? That's a big question, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I guess uh, one of the best resources out there is uh, Hope for HIE because they have an excellent website, uh, you know, where it's really explained uh, well what's the different diagnosis. Uh, I think what is great also is the, the support that you can provide to family and you have extended this support, you know, to social worker. Um, and additional- And a child life specialist too. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and additional services that are hard to get quickly in, in the community. So, so I, I think uh, definitely the best resources are out there. Um, I think we, we have done a website uh, that is called neobrainparents.org. Uh, um, the goal of the website was more to give an overview of what is happening in the NICU and what to expect after the NICU with a link to um, some of the things, because we had parents that asked, like, how, how, do, how will I know if my kid 
he's, he's late doing something or mm. how will I know, you know, if he's missing a milestone, uh, if I don't see the doctor. So, so there is a link to a website that explain uh, at this age, here is the baby, what should, should he do? Um, to give some tool and some exercise of what can be done, you know, again, not to overstimulate, but just to uh, stimulate and know what to expect because sometimes as new parents is hard to, to know what uh, uh, to expect. Um, and I think the Newborn Society um, also published a, a, an article supporting family in their child journey with neonatal encephalopathy. Uh, Betsy was one of the co-author, uh, and in there, there's also a table with resources around the world, you know, OPA, HIE, Neobrain Parents, but also other websites for different parts of the world uh, with the same goal um, to give some support and educate parents. So, so there are resources out there. I think, you know, um, they are getting better now, which is, which is good, you know, uh, so that parents uh, find support more easily than before where you type on Google and you only find um, terrible things about HIE, at least now you find some hope. Yeah, and and just, and valid information that's medically supported and-, and Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the most important thing too. Um, thank you so much again for joining us. Um, your expertise and knowledge has been just so valuable to our community. And it's just wonderful to know that we can rely on amazing people like you who are working so hard to um, make improvements um, for, for our kids. So thank you for everything you do and for joining us and for providing just another layer of education for our families. And thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so happy you guys are doing a fantastic job. You know, so. appreciate it. Well, thank you, and thanks to everyone who came. Um, I will be posting the um, complete video on our YouTube channel, and you'll see key takeaways and blogs um, about this in the next couple of days. So stay tuned. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.